Okay, so hi, welcome back from your break. Uh, my name is Takeshi Tajima from Jasper. Uh, sorry, Obos. Uh, Obos is auto based BSW software company in Japan. And I am a member of Jasper, next generation high speed run working group. Uh, this is a session on application higher layer connectivity. We will have three presentations. Okay. Now we are going to have a presentation. The presentation is centralized software and zonal architectures for future innovative ambient lightning enabled by E2B 10 T1S. I would like to welcome Fion Hurley from Analog Devices and Christine Matthews from BMW. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. I've, I have to start this presentation with two apologies. One is that I'm giving the presentation today. It was originally intended that my colleague um, Peter Wilms would give the presentation, but due to illness, he had to cancel the last minute. The second uh, apologies that I have to give is that I'm starting with some advertisement. Since now, the automotive ethernet book has a Japanese translation. <laughs> And there is a second book, it's called Automotive High-Speed Communication Technologies, which is also out now. Book sales start next week, so it's all hot off the press and brand new. So, having completed the advertisement section, um, I'd like to start the presentation on centralized software and zonal architectures for future innovative ambient lighting en enabled by E2B 10 base T1S. Uh, wrong side. Let me see. Okay, so we have three parts. One is um, ambient lighting future needs. The other is uh, solving system challenges. And the third topic is measurement results and summary. Um, when you think of ambient lighting, we first start with the topic of light. And I'd like you all to close your eyes for a very short moment and think of light. So one of the points with light, it is really, really essential, right? It's really basic, it's really fundamental. Without light, there wouldn't be any life. So when you think of um, how it influences or impacts you when you're in a room where you have very bright light or when you have the light in, in a softer tone or when you take photos, yeah? People like taking photos in the morning light or after sunrise or just in the evening before sunset because that's when the night light is nicest. And we can feel that. Now, quite some of us here have traveled to Japan. We have jet lag, right? We have a time change. And it's the light that makes us adapt to the new system, the daylight that helps us getting back into the new rhythm. So light is very fundamental. It's very essential. And it affects us on a subconscious level. And it affects us emotionally. So with the new technologies and the lighting possibilities that we have with the LED lights in general and in, in the cars, it's also up to the car manufacturers now to have um, significantly more elaborate light designs in the cars than were possible in the past. So it's sort of a new trend of emotionally reach the car customers of the cars to have light design. We had sound designs, or we have sound designs, and now we have the light designs as the next step. And of course, we have various other industries that are already move, moving fast forward to enable and, and allow for this light. So the four key words that we have here are intelligent, life, dynamic, and modern for the new light in the future. 
And we start with the light as we have it in the BMW cars, the ambient light in 2021. And you have the, on the right side, you have the, um, the uh, system on how it's set up. It consists of um, a central unit, the BCP, where the light um, commands are issued. You have individual lights, uh, LED lights, that are each addressed uh, directly via their LIN light nodes. So they are on the, um, they're this side here. Um, and then you have, you have LIN hubs and they connect to these um, LED strips. And if each of these LEDs has about, uh, has maximum 63 LEDs. And each of them has its own um, LIN hub, and that LIN hub contains a microcontroller, and um, that it also accesses on this LIN hub um, storage of um, lighting effects, or I often call them light pictures or light images. So it has a certain number of pre stored light images, and via the BCP and the LIN. It receives a command, now issue light picture one, or light picture three, or light effect five, or whatever. But of course, when you do this kind of architecture, um, first of all, it's quite tricky to actually synchronize via the LIN and the software and these different um, elements all together. But it also, you're very limited. Um, you can't really, you have only a limited number of light images that you can store, you only can issue a certain re uh, dynamic range um, limited by the capacity of the LIN bus on how often you refresh your images. So it is a very, um, well, it, it is a good start, but now we can do more and we wanted to do more. And um, so we invested different bus systems and different architectures on how to actually realize this. So for the 25 architecture, um, we have a, a different system. That's a bit overwhelming when we look at it at first, but it's actually not that complicated. We have here a microcontroller. This little star says where actually the image is being generated or the light effect is being generated. And it's not generated by I want image one, two, three. It issues the complete sequence of every single LED in brightness, in color command for every single LED you have. And I think we have up to 600 LEDs in the new system. So it's, it's a quite significant change. And then you have your general ethernet network and you don't really, um, yeah, it's transparent to you to your light commands, and you then put that on this uh, ten base T one S bus, and that's simply because ten base T one S is enough data rate for those light images that we have for the commands, and then you have this E to B hub, and um, on the physical layer it also connects uh, well, obviously to the ten megabit, and then it uses the E to B as a transport protocol that then um, yeah, allows to control the LEDs that are connected in, in these outside um, connections. And the key point is that the E2B hub has no software itself. So the images and all the software processing is done here, and this is hardware encoded, and we don't no longer need a microcontroller. Those of you who are car manufacturers or those of you who've worked with car manufacturers, which probably most of you have, know we always like to get more, but we don't want to pay more, right? So being able to eliminate the microcontroller from the LIN hubs and um, having this as hardware nodes only compensates for actually having a higher data rate that we connect this with. So that's a new system, and um, it also allows, it, it integrates into any zonal approach that you have, because we have the Ethernet network, and um, yeah, various other aspects that we had in the, the wiring harness or 
um, that, that it allows us to do differently and better in the future. And um, it allows to synchronize. Well, you all know Ethernet. We have things like the presentation time and we have timestamps that we can use and deploy. And we can really have fast updates. So the update timeline um, here is the free refresh rate is uh, every 20 milliseconds for, for the dynamically changing light image that we have. Um, this is what it could look like in a car. You have three different elements. You have an E to B hub, or you can have several E to B hubs. We have the ambient interior light, which actually changes color and brightness, and we have functional interior light um, that we can also address all using the same um, infrastructure, communication infrastructure for this. And of course, this also scales, you can add, you can reduce, you can have, as I said, various LIN hubs. Um, this is the picture a little bit more in, in detail. We have the, um, the 10 megabit, the data coming in from the 10 megabit bus, it translates into the format read by the LEDs and the LED strips, the ILAS. Um, we have we organize the power supply, um, which comes from the from the zonal ECUs, and um, yeah, we can have small cars or large cars uh, with more or less of these lights. And um, if we want in the future, we can even add more, more and make it even more elaborate than it already is. So. That is the introduction of the light system that we have, and with that, I'll pass on to Fion. Thanks very much, Kirsten. So, uh, as Kirsten said, she stood in last minute, so I gotta thank her a lot. I guess I'll maybe buy two of her books uh, to pay for it. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about solving the system challenges. So uh, key to success here was early engagement. So analog devices and, and BMW engaged early to understand the system needs for the ambient lighting system. We broke this down into four key challenges that had to be addressed. Uh, so the first challenge is that the system is adaptable, flexible, upgradable, so a software-defined system. The second challenge is that it aligns with zonal-based architectures. Uh, the third is that uh, that edge node that Kirsten talked about is an all-hardware optimized implementation. And the fourth is to provide a synchronized animation. So that's within the lighting system itself, but also then across functions in the car as well. So by identifying these system challenges, by uh, working early with uh, the end customer, and with BMW's desire to drive an ambient lighting system, we could bring in new technologies and new system partitioning into the solution. So this resulted in a, a brand new architecture for the ambient lighting system. So, so Kirsten's already introduced this. The central ECU connected via 100 base T1 to the first zone ECU, 100 base T1 to the second zone ECU, and then tin based T1S out to these E2B hubs, which drive the, the ILAS interface to the LEDs directly. So the, the key blocks here to note, and the ones we're going to dig into more, is the uh, centralizing of software. It is the, uh, the zonal type architecture with Ethernet switches uh, through the network. Then it is the hardware edge nodes. And finally, it's the uh, synchronization using TSN capabilities. So to the to the first challenge, uh, and that's in defining a software-defined car. Okay, so the requirements here were to support a full over-the-air updates. All software had to be located in the user space. It had to be easy to update and maintain, and then we had to support the advanced animation routines Kirsten described. And we had to provide for cross-functional synergies as well. 
So the, the solution here is the centralizing of all that software. So all the ambient lighting software is located in the user space in the, in the central ECU. And the, the key blocks are shown here. So, oh, excuse me. So we have the lighting master, which generates the animation. And then we have the lighting driver as well. So, so here there's two key blocks. There is the eyelash driver, and there's the E2B driver. And the location of the E2B driver here allows us to take the MCU, the software, out of that edge node, out of that E2B hub, and centralize it back up in the ECU. But we're going to talk more about that in a few slides. So the, the second requirement here is to align with zonal architectures. So the requirements were to ensure that the system is upgradable, so we can add more nodes with minimum requalification. The second requirement is that it's reusable. So again, <coughs> excuse me, can be re reused across multiple systems. So we can save uh, cost and uh, time to market. So the solution here is an all Ethernet uh, solution. We use switches, so <coughs> excuse me. we no longer need to bridge to legacy networks. Okay. So with the use of switches, we also um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> we also um, can use other Ethernet services, so such as uh, TSN, security, and wake sleep. <clears throat> so the, the third requirement here is to provide an optimized edge load. So the goal here is it must be easy to implement, <clears throat> must have identical performance across all nodes, must not have any software qualification, and must provide for synchronization and determinism. Also must have a very small form factor. So one of the, the concerns with bringing Ethernet to the edge is adding complexity. So with traditional implementations, we have the MCU and the software to uh, add to the edge node. So this does add complexity. Aligning that with the lack of an optimal Ethernet technology. <laughs> Thanks, Derek. <laughs> So aligning that with the lack of a, an optimized edge node uh, Ethernet technology, there's been a, a reluctance to um, bring Ethernet to edge nodes. So with the availability now of 10-base T1S, and with, the, um, with, with that 10-base T1S solution, we've addressed one of the concerns. We now need to address the second concern of removing complexity from the edge node. So what we did here is we uh, developed a highly integrated 10-base T1S platform. So you can see here, we get to an all hardware edge node. We remove the software, software qualification from that edge node. This allows us to simplify over-the-air updates. We get a very high degree of determinism. Diagnostics can be done at ECU level. And it also, by going to an all hardware edge node, we can offer uh, a higher level of security with less surface uh, for threats. So the product that we use here is shown on the top right. So this is what is used, it's a highly integrated 10 base T1S edge node. So there's a 10 base T1S Phi, a Mac, the low complexity Ethernet engine. So that removes uh, the need for software and software qualification. There's an array of interfaces. The one used here is, is ILAS. And it also supports wake up, uh, sleep functionality from TC10 and topology discovery from TC14. So now if we look at what is in the E2B hub. So in the E2B hub, you can see it's a very simple 
implementation. We have the 10 base T1S interface that connects to the E2B chip and that drives directly the ILAS interface. So you can see there's no MCU, no software in that edge node. So now we've got a very simple to implement edge node solution. So we've, we've really addressed the concern of Ethernet adding complexity to edge nodes. So by, by taking out the software, the microcontroller, we have a very easy to implement edge node. So the, the fourth topic is synchronization. So there are two sets of requirements here. There is the synchronization within the lighting system for synchronized anima animation. And the requirements here are that it must be stable with less than one to two milliseconds of jitter. And it must be highly accurate with a refresh rate of 50 hertz, which is the 20 milliseconds requirement. It must also support varying LED strip lens. The second requirement is that it must support cross-application synchronization. So again, for something like an optimal HMI experience, the delay must be less than 150 milliseconds. And it must also be easy to adjust it to align to other functions like ambilight, uh, hazard detection, safe exit. So if we look at the, the error sources that are introduced here, so the, the, uh, there are two main sources of error. Okay, so the first one is the varied network path delay. So that's shown here by the, oh, excuse me, by the green path and the orange path. So you can see here straight away, there's gonna be different cable harness lengths that will need to be compensated for. And also the number of switches that will be passed through can vary as well, okay? The second main source of error is in software. So we had a requirement earlier that the software must run in the user space. So with that, there is an accuracy that the clock base that can be guaranteed is plus or minus 40 milliseconds. <clears throat> so that won't be enough to reach our 50 hertz refresh rate. So again, we have to now come up with solutions to two of these problems. So the, the first solution is to ensure all nodes are synchronized with GPTP time base. Okay, we can use the presentation time on the edge node to actuate the lighting system. We design our system to ensure that it's uh, able to tolerate worst case network delay and also that it is uh, able to compensate for the software. <coughs> um, also because we've got an all hardware edge node, it's got a very fixed deterministic latency and we can get very high levels of accuracy on that edge node. For to support the cross application requirements, the time base is shared across all nodes, okay? So again, now we have a common time base so we can have synchronized uh, orchestration of sensors and actuators. So, looking at the solution here, there, there are two parts. So, uh, again, uh, for the software point of view, direct drive isn't possible. Okay. So, what we do is we insert the uh, animation presentation time. This is sent with every packet over the network. Multiple um, animation routines can be sent at one time. These can be stored and queued up on the hardware, and then they will be actuated by on the edge node based on the presentation time. So with that, we'll touch on the measurement summary and a wrap up. So what we see here on the left is the system that was built up to prove out the proof of concept. 
So we have the central ECU. We have two switchboards. These go from uh, 1000 base T1 to 100 base T1. Then we come out 10 base T1S to the ETB hubs. And from there, we drive out the lighting strip. So what we did then was measure the time on the ILAS interface. And you can see here, we get a constant 20 milliseconds, 50 hertz refresh rate. And this is constant, uh, so it's very accurate. We talked a lot about ambient lighting. I suppose just to point out for 10 base T1S and ETB, that there is a broad range of applications that the technology can target. So lighting is one, both internal and external, but there's also many others. So keyless entry, radar, LiDAR, ultrasonics, uh, connecting to things like sub-ECU, so door ECU, a seat ECU. And what we have found as, as people become more familiar with 10 base T1S, more and more applications continue to emerge. So just to, to summarize, the, the ambient lighting system has gone, undergone significant changes. We are, uh, by leveraging Ethernet, TSN, switches, we've really simplified the implementation. By bringing 10 base T1S out to the edge nodes, we've further simplified the system design. By using E2B, which is a highly integrated 10 base T1S edge node, we're able to move to an all hardware edge node, which again brings system optimization and reduces the complexity of the edge node. So what we see here is a system ready for production in 2025 using 10 base T1S and E2B. So we look forward to seeing this system roll out and we look forward to seeing many other systems of a similar type technology rolling out as well. Okay, so we'll take some questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you for your great presentation. So uh, we open the questions. Okay, this is a little bit unfair because I thought I would be in the audience and can ask a question. <laughs> Um, so my question, I have a first question. Um, this is, a, of course, the E2B transport protocol is now something that was, um, uh, how do I sell, developed by, uh, by ADI. Mm -hmm. How are you going to ensure a multi-vendor environment for this? Yep. That's a very surprising question, Kirsten. Um, <laughs> So we, we, we obviously are very aware of the, the need for supply continuity and the desire for multi-vendor. Um, so we are open to all possibilities. Okay. Uh, please state your name and ask you. Uh, my name is Rajiv Roy. I work for NXP. I have two questions. One is, how many E2B nodes do you need to support on the 10 base T1S? That's the first. And the second, do you have any functional safety requirements for nodes like this? And if yes, how do you support that with the hardware-only solution? Thank you. Yeah, so the, the number of E2B nodes on, on the bus will depend on the number of LED strips, et cetera, that have to be supported. So that can vary from one to pick a number, okay? You know, eight, nine, 10. Right now, uh, for first cars, it's a one ETB hub for the first car that, that's gonna roll out in 2025. Um, with regards to functional safety, um, the ambient lighting system is not a functionally safe re requirement, so it doesn't, doesn't have that requirement. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is the last question. <clears throat> oh, thank you. So, hello, this is Pierre Giorgio from Onsemi. So, first of all, thank you for the presentation. And uh, as you know, being one of the uh, fathers for time based T1S, I'm delighted to see that he's putting at good use. Uh, <laughs> so, um, 
I think I had two questions, but one is already answered uh, from a question by Kirsten. The other one would be, did you thought about using also power over data lines mm -hmm. on top of this technology? I think it's one of the features of 10 base T1S that could be useful. I heard you said you're going to use topology discovery and I am going to make a presentation tomorrow about that. So thank you for that. But uh, I was wondering about Poodle now. Yeah, good question. So um, this particular system doesn't deploy Poodle, okay? Um, again, of course, Poodle can be, well, power over 10 base T1S is supported, okay, by the technology. Um, and of course, analog devices have a lot of Poodle technology. Um, but um, it wasn't required in this system, but, but our hardware, as does others' hardware, support uh, power over 10 base T1S. The power requirements here are pretty high for the LED systems. Yeah, I can imagine. Thank you. Okay, so again, uh, thank you for a great presentation.